Uh, hi everyone, welcome to our fifth seminar uh, of the West series. Um, welcome. Uh, today we've got um, Ashley Martini from the University of California Merced and hopefully uh, a bit later we'll have Victoria Van Camp from SKF. Um, we're also going to have uh, our two, um, two of our poster winners from the uh, poster competition to give uh, short five minute presentations uh, on their posters. Um, so they're going to start. So Sam, if I could ask you to share your screen first. Sure. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, when when I'm going to start? Yeah, just start whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready now. Hi everyone, my name is Chen Peng Yang. You can call me Sam. I'm a PhD student from University of California, Merced. My advisor is Professor Ashley Martini. I'm happy to be here to present my work. Today, my topic is nanoscale friction of hydrophilic and hydrophobic self-assembled monolayers, SAMs, in water. As we know, there are many problems in MEMS, such as friction, wear, and adhesion. SAMs as, is a good solution to these problems since it's small enough to be fit into MEMS and it can be used to modify the surface properties of the components in MEMS. To stud study the friction of SAMS, we performed both experiments and the simulations. For the experiments, we first nanografted hydrophobic SAMS into hydrophilic SAMS. Then friction image was taken using AFM. For the simulations, a model was first built. The blue color in the model is water molecules. The yellow is SAMS. The left half of the SAMS is hydrophilic. The right half of the SAMS is hydrophobic. Then molecular dynamics simulations were run to get the friction forces. Now let's first look at the experimental results. The topo topography image on the left shows that the hydrophilic SAMs and hydrophobic SAMs have the same height. However, looking at the friction force, uh, friction force image on the right, we can see that the hydrophilic SAMs has larger friction force than hydrophobic SAMs. Here is the simulation result, which is consistent with the experimental result. As the load increases, the friction forces increase. An interesting, interesting thing here is that the friction force is the summation of tip water force and the tip sam force. Although the tip sam force of hydrophilic sams is smaller than hydrophobic sams, the total friction force of hydrophilic sams is larger compared to that of hydrophobic sams. This is because of the much larger uh, tip water force of hydrophilic SAMs compared to that of hydrophobic SAMs. Uh, since tip water force plays such an important role in friction force, we want to know how it works. We notice that the hydrogen bonds only occur on hydrophilic SAMs. As the temperature increases, both the number of hydrogen bonds and the tip water force of hydrophilic SAMs decrease. This indicates that hydrogen bonding contributes to tip water force and friction force. To conclude, the friction force is the summation of tip SAM force and the tip water force. The tip SAM force of hydrophilic SAMs is smaller than hydrophobic SAMs. However, the tip water force of hydrophilic SAMs is much larger than hydrophobic SAMs due to the hydrogen bonding. So therefore, as a result, the total friction force of hydrophilic SAMs 
is larger than hydrophobic sands. This work has been published in Tribology Letters, and you can scan the QR code to access the paper. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, Carlos, if you could, Thanks. Sam, if you could now um, close the video and mute yourself, and Carlos, if you could load up your slides. Yeah, um, one second. Uh, let's start. There we go. Can you see it all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Carlos Ayestan La Torre uh, from the Tribology Group at Imperial. And I'm doing my PhD under the supervision of James Ewan and Professor Daniel Lettini. And I'm going to just briefly talk about uh, some ab initio calculations we did to study uh, the mechanisms for the interaction between water molecules and doped diamond surfaces. So those of you familiar with it, uh, you will know that diamond-like carbon or DLC coatings, uh, they're very interesting in tribology uh, because of the properties, very low friction coefficient, very high wear resistance, uh, ultra hardness, similarly in biomedicine uh, because they are biocompatible. And different types of DLC coatings have different hydrophobic properties and these are important uh, in the different applications. So for example, uh, when there is high relative humidity, hydrophilic coatings uh, present lower friction coefficient than hydrophobic, but the tendency is reverse when there is lower relative humidity. Similarly, uh, when it comes to um, the biocompatibility. So, let me just one second. Yeah, uh, this is an example of an ab initio molecular dynamic simulations carried out in the group of uh, Professor Riggi. And what we see is that um, these are sliding diamond surfaces, and this is a water interface. At some point, the water molecules, like right here, dissociate onto the surface, so they hydroxylate the surface. And these hydroxyls participate in the hydrogen network and drag along a water layer with them. So that, that is an important property when it comes to hydro hydrophilicity. If you dump the surface, in this example, um, these blue atoms, they studied, um, these, these blue atoms are silicon atoms, and they studied that they lower the energy barrier for the water dissociation. So they enhance hydroxylation, um, and thus they enhance hydrophilicity. And there is a fun fundamental uh, mechanism that was uh, studied through this modeling method. So we wanted to have a similar look, what would happen if we were to dope the surface with boron, nitrogen, or oxygen dopants. Yeah, so as I said, we wanted to look at the fundamental mechanisms. Most of the uh, body uh, in the literature is uh, experimental research, but the actual microscopical uh, mechanisms are, well, the understanding of them is still lacking. So we wanted to have that kind of insight that modeling can, can provide and hopefully drive uh, future coding design. So I'm not going to go through all the different results that we got, but the idea is that we, we map the whole um, reaction from the moment a water molecule interacts with a non-hydroxylated or hydrogenated surface, uh, then it dissociates, what are the different dissociation uh, pathways and, and energy barriers, and then how the uh, hydroxylated or hydrogenated surfaces interact with a, an extra water molecule. So for example, if you see here, this is a non-doped uh, diamond surface. As I said, the water, water molecule dissociates, we get the energy barriers, uh, similarly, one of the um, most in interesting mechanisms that we found is in the case of boron doped, which is the, this blue atom over here. The boron can adopt a tetragonal conformation that chemisorbs a water molecule. So that acts as an immediate uh, mechanism with no uh, associated energy barrier to trap these water molecules that then can interact in the um, uh, hydrogen bond network. And as I say, for the different dopants, we started. Um, what, what are the dissociation uh, pathways? And similarly, once the surface are, once the molecules are dissociated and the surfaces are hydrogenated and hydroxylated, we want to see how this hydrogen and hydroxyl fragments interact with an extra water molecule, what would be a water interface. Um, again, there are different results and favored mechanisms for the different dopants. Uh, one that can be seen here, for example, um, when I'm 
when a normal diamond surface is hydrogenated, is usually considered to be hydrophobic, right? Because ca carbon hydrogen bonds are not very polar and they don't interact very strongly with water molecules, which would be the case on the left hand image. On the contrary, on the right hand image, we found what, that um, nitrogen dopants, when they are bonded with, uh, with hydrogens, those are polar bonds that interact way more strongly with water molecules and they drag them closer. So, so that's one of the mechanisms that nitrogen dopants favor. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, so as I said, we, we studied different fundamental me and favored mechanisms for the different, different dopants uh, that could help explain some of their results, uh, experimental results in the literature. Uh, hopefully, uh, this can guide uh, future coating designs. Um, yeah, looking forward in case there is any questions. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks to James, Daniele, and Clelia, uh, the other uh, collaborators of this work, um, to Afton Chemical Imperial College and the EPSSC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, if you could, yeah, again, um, close your video and mute yourself. Yeah. And then if Ashley Martini, um, if you could load up your slides, please. Here, let's see. <clears throat> Can you see them? Yeah, that's perfect. Oh. Okay, so um, so now I've got Professor Ashley Martini from the University of California, Merced. Uh, she's going to talk about reactive molecular dynamic simulations of tribochemical reactions. Um, yeah, if you could take it away, Ashley. All right, well, hello everyone and thank you for being here. I'm really excited about this web seminar series on tribology and I'm really pleased to be a part of what I hope is an ongoing activity in our community. As James mentioned, I'm talking about tribal chemical reactions and the use of reactive molecular simulations to study them. So this topic is generally motivated by the important role of tribal films. As we know, lubricating oils, greases, and hydraulic fluids have surface active additives. And during operation of mechanical components, these additives form protective films on surfaces. These films offer a low friction and wear, particularly in boundary lubrication. To understand this role a little better, let's take a quick peek at the Strybeck curve. As we see here, friction is a function of speed, viscosity, and pressure. Starting from the far right, we're in the full film lubrication regime where the surfaces are entirely separated by a liquid. As we move left, we go through mixed lubrication and finally boundary. This plateau or so constant friction that we're used to seeing in boundary lubrication is in fact attributable to tribal films. If there were no surface active additives and no tribal films in boundary lubrication, we would instead see very high friction and likely detrimental wear. So tribal films are incredibly important to the function of any lubricated mechanical component. However, we still don't really know how tribal films form. We do know, however, that uh, tri tribology is a necessary condition. So if you put a lubricant or an additive on a surface in ambient conditions, nothing happens. If you instead put that lubricant inside of a sliding rolling contact, you generate a tribal film. So something inside of that contact is driving film formation. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to look inside the contact to observe the process directly. So understanding tribal film formation continues to be an opportunity and a challenge within the tribology community. Towards that goal, there have been many excellent studies using surface characterization tools to study tribal film composition. Just a couple representative examples are shown here and many such studies have been performed. But one of the key take home messages is that tribal films comprise elements from both the additives and the surfaces. And the key take home message from that is that these films likely grow through chemical reactions between the additive molecules and the surfaces. Another approach to studying tribal films is to measure their growth or their growth rates. And again, a couple examples are shown here where a ZDDP growth rate is measured as a function of operating conditions. And these growth rates reflect the rates of chemical reactions between additives and surfaces that lead to tribal film formation. And they've shown us that operating conditions within the tribological contact affect growth rates. So the key question then is what's happening inside the contact to drive these reactions that lead to film formation? 
Uh, the answer is quite a bit. First of all, we could have uh, viscous for frictional heating that drives the reactions thermally. We can have wear that leads to re uh, new reactive surfaces as well as asperity, asperity contact leading to tribal emission. And then we also have the mechanical forces that are inherent to the contact, specifically the pressure and the shear stress. And any and all of these can and probably do drive reactions leading to tribal film formation under different conditions. So one may ask, is any of these necessary or is any of these dominant? And to partially answer this question, a very elegant study was performed a few, a few years ago with ZDDP in EHL conditions. And the key aspect of this study was that it was performed at very low speeds and with a thick viscosity uh, base oil, such that there was no surface-surface contact. So we can eliminate frictional heating, wear, and tribal emission as one of the things driving the observed tribal film formation. Then they repeated the study with two different base oils, one more viscous than the other, such that with the same normal pressure, the same pressure, you get two different shear stresses. And they found that they only observed tribal film formation in the case of the high viscosity, high shear stress oil. Therefore, in this case, shear stress is a necessary and the dominant case, the dominant factor driving film formation. To understand how shear stress drives film formation or drives reactions leading to film formation, we turn to, um, to an equation and a formulation that we borrow from mechanochemistry, where the rate of a reaction is related to the height of a barrier, an energy barrier that must be overcome for that reaction to proceed. In the absence of mechanical force, this energy barrier is the thermal activation energy, but it can be lowered by mechanical force, in this case, shear stress, um, by this factor Ea star. And the amount by which you can lower the barrier and accelerate the reaction is proportional to shear stress times an activation volume. And I'm gonna come back to this equation and these terms a little bit later in the presentation. But let's step back and look what we have as a tribology community to understand tribal films. We have surface characterization tools that tell us uh, what's in the reactants and the products. We have film growth rate measurements that tell you how fast these films grow or how fast the reactions proceed. And we have a theoretical framework for understanding how shear stress can drive the reactions that get us from reactant to product. However, I suggest there's a missing piece here that tells us how we get from reactant to product and how shear stress drives that. And to fill this gap, I suggest that atomistic modeling is an appropriate tool. And this is what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. Specifically, I'll be talking about reactive molecular dynamic simulations. This is a tool that's been um, available in our community for a while. And there's two pieces of input that are input that are used. First, there are the initial positions of atoms and bonds that describe the chemical system of interest. And second, there's an empirical model or force field that tells us how those atoms interact. In a classical force field, Chemical bonds are modeled as harmonic springs. And in a reactive force field, the concept of a bond order is introduced such that the simulation can capture the formation and breaking of, of chemical bonds. So one more quick note on the method and these empirical potentials, they necessarily have many, many parameters. And these parameters have to be fit to match uh, energies predicted or calculated via first principles. So it's a quite uh, extensive process it's important to note that it must be performed for each chemical system or chemical family of interest, and they're not always transferable. But once you have a reactive force field, uh, reactive molecular dynamic simulations can, can become an incredibly powerful tool that lets you look inside of a contact and observe as bonds break and form and reactions proceed leading to film formation. So with this type of tool, we can start to answer some of the fundamental questions underlying tribal films. And the ones I'm gonna to talk to you about today are how reactions lead to film formation, how does shear drive those reactions, and for a given shear stress, by how much can you accelerate one of these film forming reactions? And for each of these, I'm gonna go through a small case study that demonstrates how reactive simulations have been and can be applied to answer each question. For the first one, I'm gonna talk about a case study involving phosphate esters on ferrous surfaces. 
So this is an application relevant example because of trichrosylphosphate or TCP that has been around for many years and is still widely used in the aviation industry. Uh, there have been many mechanisms proposed for how we get from the additive TCP to tribal films, but they generally involve the same key steps. These are decomposition of the, of the additive molecule and reactions or chemisorption between radicals and surfaces, which iterate and facilitate each other, leading to phosphorus containing film formation. And I would say that generally these two steps underlie the film growth for most anti-wear and extreme pressure additives. But in the case of TCP, uh, it, the, the, the resultant film is phosphorus containing. However, because decomposition is one of the first key steps, it provides a way to fundamentally understand the process. In this example, uh, GCMS was used by some colleagues uh, at Army Research Lab, and they studied the decomposition of TCP into Cresol, the primary decomposition product. And they performed this experiment um, on two different iron oxide surfaces and with two different TCP isomers. As shown in this plot, they found interestingly that there's more Cresol. In other words, there's more reactivity on the Fe203 as compared to Fe304 surface. And also that the para TCP isomer is more reactive than the meta TCP isomer. So this is obviously not a simple process and something that should and can be investigated further using reactive simulations. So let's come back to our process or our simulation design. I told you there's two pieces of input that come into these simulations. First, we identify, or in this case, parameterize a potential for the system of interest. And then we put the atoms in the positions describing the chemical system. And finally, we can allow the atoms and the bonds to evolve over time and observe the process. And this is typical of how one uses reactive simulations to study tribal film formation. In this particular example, we studied the two different iron oxide surfaces and the two different isomers, and we're able to generally reproduce the observation of more crystal generation on the Fe203 and with the para isomer. However, once we reproduce experimental results, the real power or the real um, contribution of these types of simulations is their ability to understand and explain why. And often this is done using reaction pathways. So reaction pathways show us how you get from reactant to product and each one of the steps in between. And I would say that this is probably one of the strengths of the reactive simulation approach. In this particular case, we identified three different reaction pathways that got us from TCP to Cresol. These are hydroxylation, polymerization, and adsorption. And we can use this kind of information in various ways. For example, we can analyze statistics and look at the relative observation or the relative frequency of each pathway for the different oxide surfaces and the different uh, TCP isomers and potentially explain the differences in their reactivity and the differences in their ability to form films under different conditions. With these types of simulations, we can also dive a little bit deeper and look at individual atoms and bonds. In this study, TCP was compared to four different um, alkyl phosphates and a, a variety of different analyses was, were performed. But here I'm showing you the dissociation of individual bonds within the TCP, specifically carbon hydrogen, carbon oxygen, and phosphorus oxygen. There's lots of data to be mined here, but one thing that you could notice right away is that the carbon oxygen dissociation is more dominant for the secondary alkyls whereas the phosphorus oxygen di dissociation is more dominant for the TCP and the primary alkyls. So these simulations give you access to atom by atom information that can help uh, reveal the fundamental mechanisms of how we get from additive to tribal film. So the second key question is how does shear drive these reactions? As I showed you previously, the key factor, although many factors in the tribological contact can drive film formation, Shear seems to be the key. So for this, I'm gonna look at a case study involving polymerization in vapor or gas phase lubrication. So in this case, experiments were performed by my colleague Song Kim at Penn State, and he performed a ball and disc ex experiments in an alpha pinene gas at very slow speeds such that temperature rise could be neglected. And the, um, the film growth or the shear driven reactions were quantified 
as the polymer product built up on the surface in the wear track driven by shear. Simulations were designed to reproduce something similar, albeit on a much smaller length scale, where we have silica and the, allele, the um, alpha pinene, excuse me. And in this case, we were able to quantify reaction yield or quantify products in explicitly in terms of the number of high molecular weight species generated in the simulation. So with these two experiments and simulations, the first thing we did was look at the composition of the reaction product. On the left is the simulation and on the right is the experiment. And one thing that we noticed right away is that there's quite a bit of oxygen in the reaction product, in the polymerization or ligamerization product. There was no oxygen in the original alpha pinene molecule. So this, this oxygen must have come from the surface, suggesting that the surface, first of all, that the surface plays a really important role. And second of all, it probably involves chemisorption or reactions between the molecules and the surfaces consistent with, with what we said before in the, in the introduction section. Secondly, we looked at the rate of change of yield with pressure, specifically the natural log of yield with pressure. Again, simulations on the left and experiments on the right. And we tracked this uh, in terms of slope. We found that despite the many orders of magnitude differences between the experiments and simulation, the slope or the amount by which pressure accelerates these reactions is about the same, indicating that both of these two methods is exploring the same fundamental chemical system and system of equations, of, I'm sorry, system of reactions. So now that we've done that, we can look again more closely at the simulations and specifically again, we're gonna look at a reaction pathway. So we start with our alpha pinene. We see chemisorption, where we see a reaction or a bond form with the surface, again, suggested by the observation of oxygen in the reaction products. And then we see a third step we didn't expect. We see deformation, or specifically opening of this four-membered ring. And this deformation step preceded oligomerization in every case in the simulation. This suggests that the way that shear is accelerating the reaction is by deforming the molecule. To confirm this, we perform nudged elastic band calculations within the reactive um, simulation framework where we tracked uh, the, the energy barrier from reaction to product with the native molecule and with the molecule in this deformed state. And we found that for all of the reactions we investigated, the barrier was lower for the deformed molecule. This suggests that the way that shear drives this particular reaction and perhaps others is by opening a reaction pathway that's not available thermally, in this case through deformation. So lastly, I'm gonna look and I'm gonna talk to you about by how much shear can accelerate one of these reactions. And for this, we're gonna be talking about iron sulfide films that form boundary, um, bound I'm sorry, we'll be looking at iron, iron sulfide forming boundary additives. Okay, but before I dive into that, let's step back and look at the equation that I introduced to you re previously. So recall here that this is a film forming reaction rate and it's related to the height of the barrier that has to be overcome for the reaction to proceed. The height of this barrier is lowered by this, this term shear stress times activation volume. That means for a given shear stress, the amount by which you can accelerate the reaction is determined by activation volume. And this is the term that we need to quantify and understand to um, interpret the effect of mechanical stress. So many uh, previous studies have, have used this formulation to fit experimental data. I'm showing you here three different uh, experimental studies reporting tribal film growth rate, all for ZDDP as a function of stress. And in all cases, as expected, the growth rate increases with stress. The experimental data was fit to the equation at the top and the delta V, the activation volume was was extracted. And what you can see here is even though these are all ZDDP film formation, the delta V or the activation volume are completely different. So this implies that delta V isn't something inherent to the molecule itself and understanding its meaning is a little bit more complicated. So we applied, um, we, so we decided to apply simulations to, to study the meaning of the activation volume. We took something simpler though, instead of ZDDP, we looked at organosulfur extreme pressure additives and we chose this because it's pretty simple. 
And the reaction pathway has been known for a long time. It's a very simple process that involves a dissociation of the sulfur-sulfur bond, formation of sulfur-iron bonds, and the dissociation of sulfur-carbon bonds, leading to radical release and leaving a sulfur film on the surface. So even though this pathway is known, we uh, created some reactive molecular simulations to model it and ran these under different conditions and indeed found the expected reaction pathway sulfur-sulfur dissociation, sulfur-iron bond formation, and sulfur-carbon dissociation. But now that we have this reaction pathway, we can use the information available in the simulations to go a little bit further. The first step was to identify uh, the rate-limiting step of this reaction. So which of those three steps determines the overall rate of the process? To do this, we perform simulations at slowly ramped, temperature, ramped temperatures and we tracked each one of the individual steps I described, and we found that the sulfur-carbon bond dissociation occurred at the highest temperature, indicating that this is the rate-limiting step. Once we knew this, we could specifically focus on that third step and track it to measure yield and move forward. So we performed these simulations at a range of shear stresses and temperatures, and we found that, as expected based on the theoretical equation, we see more reaction yield at higher shear stresses and at higher temperatures. So more importantly, however, with this entire data set, we can turn to the equation and we can fit delta V. So we fit all that data, we extracted an activation volume of 12 angstroms cubed. So what does this mean? We have this very simple model system. Perhaps it's just the shape of that butyl group as approximated by a sphere, but that didn't seem right. Um, our, our fit activation volume was smaller than the sphere. However, our activation volume did seem reasonable if we thought about it as the cross-sectional area of the butyl group multiplied by the distance through which that butyl group travels as the bond breaks. Also, if we come back to our alpha pinene experiment, recall that we had a yield versus, versus stress. We fit that data and we got an activation volume of about seven angstroms cubed, which is nowhere close to the molar volume of the molecular species. However, we found that it was reasonable in comparison to the change of volume in the deformation step that I described as the key to how shear stress drives the reaction. So these results suggest that activation volume is a non-trivial parameter, but perhaps is related to the process by which shear stress drives reactions. And it seems that reactive simulations are an appropriate tool <clears throat> excuse me, to explore this and understand this mechanism. So briefly, I'd like to discuss some limitations. As with any uh, research tool, reactive simulations have limitations which provide us opportunities. One of the key limitations is the short time scale inherent to the simulation approach. Um, this is a particular issue for tribal chemistry because chemical reactions occur at a finite rate at a given temperature. And so to achieve those rates or to, to reproduce the reaction within a simulation, you have to push it to happen a little faster. So you can increase the temperature, you can apply higher shear stresses, these types of steps can be taken. And it's totally fine as long as you can assume that the reaction pathway is the same under the more severe or the, um, or the, for example, the higher and the lower temperatures. If it's not the same, then there's an issue with using this type of simulation approach that can potentially be overcome using accelerated simulation tools. Another major challenge or major limitation is the availability of force field parameters. I alluded to this before. Uh, there's many, many parameters that are used to describe a react in a, that are used in a reactive potential, and they're often not available for the chemical system of interest. For example, there are no reactive potentials available for ZDDP on steel. So um, this is a challenge, certainly. It becomes less of a challenge over time as more force fields are parameterized and uh, put out there in the literature, but it's really incumbent upon us as a scientific community to ensure that these parameters are made freely available and also reported clearly or described clearly what they can and cannot be used to, to uh, model. Lastly, uh, there's a challenge associated with validation. You can't often directly validate every part of a reactive simulation. You can, however, perform qualitative and even quantitative comparisons to some parts of an experiment. 
it's, it's really important that we do this so that the simulations and experiments can be used together to contribute towards understanding tribal films. However, to do this, it's really key that the simulations and experiments be designed ahead of time together such that chemical systems and conditions of interest can be identified. They're amenable to both approaches. So those limitations outstanding. I hope that I have demonstrated that um, reactive simulations are an important part of a tool set that the tribological community has to use together to apply and understand shear driven reactions and ultimately tribal film formation. And the hope is that this understanding can ultimately enable design of lubricant additives or uh, contact conditions that are both more environmentally friendly and potentially more energy efficient than currently available technologies. So I'd briefly like to acknowledge the contributions of some current and former students and postdocs that did some of the work that I showed you here as well as some collaborators whose work I highlighted in this presentation. And lastly, I'd like to thank you for your participation in this event and for attending. And I look forward to interacting with you via um, this and future opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Thank um, you very much, oh. Ashley. I have a question from Stefan Eder, and he's asking, uh, where would you place the limit for the complexity of the reaction pathways that are reproducible us using uh, reactive molecular dynamics? How many intermediate products? Is there some semi-automated way to study this? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know that there's any um, finite limit on how many intermediates or steps one can track. Um, at this stage, the process of identifying a reaction pathway always begins with a manual step. So perhaps there's some limitation in human patients, but um, I, I don't think there's necessarily a limit. But, but having said that, as I mentioned, the approach is often that you just, you just observe the simulation. You observe the quote unquote movie and watch how the system evolves. Once you can identify the key steps and identify what's going on, then you can automate the process to um, quantify and further reveal a reaction pathway. But I wouldn't say there's any specific limit. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question actually. Uh, on slide 19, um, where you talk about the dissociation of the phosphate, um, so is the product that you see, do you think that is the final product that is present in the tribal film? Do you think the tribal film is some sort of molecular crystal or so, or do you think that it will form some sort of, there will be more products than from there? Um, probably, probably both. The focus on the Cressel is specifically because that's the, uh, the product that's amenable to experimental study it's known that the primary reaction product of TCP is Cressel. So you can track the amount of Cressel to quantify the reaction. Um, the supposition is not that these, the, the resultant films are just a Cressel containing, um, are, are necessarily Cressel containing. I suspect that there's further decomposition, reactions between the surfaces and those molecules and then reactions of species within the films themselves. So I, I would say that, that was, that's just looking at the onset or the first step of the film formation process. Okay, thank you very much. And I think- Sorry, can I add one, one point to, to Stefan Eder's question? Please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, uh, his last question was, if there is some semi-automated way. So I, I would say that the answer is yes and no. So to, to re react, reactive simulations, there are some uh, automated packages to identify reaction networks um, that, but, they are not suitable to tribology because those packages usually rely on identifying molecules. The moment, the moment you put a su surface there, uh, they cannot work, right? They, they cannot deal with that assay molecule. So that is why in, in this kind of simulations, it is, um, say you, you need a kind of bespoke approach to actually identifying the, the different pathways. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Yep, I totally agree with that, thank you. Thank you very much. And now over to James. Uh, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, so our next speaker is Victoria Van Camp from SKF. Uh, Victoria, if you could um, please share. Well, Ashley, if you could stop sharing, first of all, there we go. And Victoria, if you could share your slides, please. 
Yes, I will say. And I think, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, can hear you fine. Right? You can. Perfect. And see you. Um, I'm very sorry for missing the actual right time. Oh, no I problem. think that might have been some... I'm I'm happy that uh, that you uh, could accommodate, accommodate that. So I think I'm not so used to Zoom, but I think yeah, it's sharing now. This is it? Yes, and you can now see a couple of guys with a big bearing, right? Yeah, it's coming through now. Just give it a second or so. I might turn off the video so that that because it could be on um, our side. There we go. Yeah, that's better. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, yeah so, I turn off the video. Perfect. Uh, so Victoria will talk about is tribology wearing. No. Oh. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So Victoria will talk about is tribology wearing off the role of friction wear and lubrication in the age of maintenance 4.0. Uh, take it away, Victoria. Thank you very much. Uh, so it is, uh, of course, as you all know, it's a bit weird to sit and give a, a lecture on. Uh, you feel like you're speaking into empty space and you have no idea who's listening, if they're even awake or anything. But I try. I will try my best and show you some really good pictures from real life situations where tribology is being used. Because my job then is to be the chief technology officer at uh, ABSKF. So that means I'm globally responsible for all the development of software, hardware, uh, and bearings, and tribology, and research at uh, the big bearing company, SKF. Or, as you will see, we used to call ourselves a bearing company, which, which we still are. We start presentations with a picture of a big bearing, but our customers actually would want nothing to do with bearings if they didn't have to. They would actually prefer to never buy a bearing ever again in their life if they could avoid it. Uh, and I'll show you why. So... Uh, my background is uh, indeed tribology. I did a PhD in mechanical engineering with focus on tribology and specifically on grease lubrication, uh, grease lubrication of bearings and very much in weird temperatures, like very cold temperatures. These two guys that you see on the screen here, oh, and I should say, I worked for SKF for 24 years uh, in a bunch of different roles, um, more on the business side and management side the last the uh, last few years. So these two guys, why are they holding a bearing? Well, actually, this bearing has been taken out of service. And as you can see, it's actually missing a roller uh, next to one of, the, one of the guys' hands. They are uh, workers in a service center of SKF in uh, uh, Colombia. So this is our service center in, in Bogota. And the bearing was made once upon a time in Gothenburg, Sweden. Um, which is the place where we make large size circle roller bearings, still the main site. It was shipped to Colombia and it was put into a big crusher in some mine or other over in Colombia. Because of the Internet of Things, uh, because of sensors and uh, good algorithms, we can call them, this bearing was actually taken out of service before it failed. And that means that uh, what these two guys are doing is Remanufacturing the bearing. That means they're polishing, they're going to polish it up. They're going to put in a new roller where that one is missing. They probably took it out because it has some dense rust or something. Uh, and this bearing will go back again into service, into probably the same crusher or a similar one uh, over in Colombia or maybe elsewhere in Latin America. And what did we do with? this uh, little trick of remanufacturing. Well, actually, we sold one less bearing, and <laughs> which may be a bad thing, but I'll show you later why it's not. Uh, we also saved a little bit of the environment because we shipped one bearing less from Sweden over to Latin America. And we also didn't remelt a bearing locally. We just polished it up and put it back in again. So good for the customer good for the environment, 
and in fact good for SKF. But let's come to how that is good for SKF. What I speak and describe here <clears throat> is something that we can call maintenance 4.0. Probably many of you have heard about industry 4.0, where everything is digitalized, optimized, happens by itself. But in that, something that uh, the, the German professors that uh, once uh, put that word into use, one thing that they forgot is that in making that work, you also need a maintenance 4.0. If you have guys running around with stethoscopes and hammers, you're not going to have an optimized, wonderful production that Mrs. Merkel and President Obama can go and smile at in Hanover Fair. So maintenance 4.0 is a prerequisite to make any industry 4.0 happen. So new technology makes this possible. So in Zoom, I have an interesting... Ah, there we go. So... I think uh, you should see a different picture on the screen now, but uh, SKF has actually shifted the way we do business from selling ball bearings. And I know very well that this is a roller bearing, not a ball bearing, uh, but I do that sometimes to my customers just to make them awake. Uh, this is a roller bearing, and here is what we normally use to sell to people. But it wasn't a very good offer. Because you're in a factory somewhere, this thing shows up, you have to mount it, and that is probably not a good thing. We have lots of competitors that do the same. So we have instead listened to what our customers are interested in buying, and that is reliable rotation. So what you actually see here on the screen is uh, two rotating shafts uh, or rolls in a paper mill. This is uh, from actually from a Swedish paper mill. You might think that this is from the 18th century or something, but it's not. This is from 2019. Here is how machinery looks like in the age of uh, Industry 4.0. But it's perfectly fine machinery, and it works really well if you maintain it well. So what I was saying before, that no customer ever wants to buy a ball bearing or a roller bearing, by the way. Uh, they don't because... If they do, it means that something failed. It means that one of those bearings that you see behind a lid here has failed and that paper machine is not running. It's standing still and somebody has to change a bearing. So our customers actually want to buy uptime or reliable rotation. They don't want to buy bearings and that has a lot of implications behind it. It actually means that for SKF, we are in the very process of shifting from selling ball bearing or peddling ball bearings to providing reliability in machinery with rotating shafts. And as you can see here on the screen, in very nasty environments as well. So here is where tribology is really put to use. And in the end, it's actually put to use to produce that paper that you see uh, spinning by on the right-hand side here, which is where the customer makes money when that comes out. So, for us, what actually was happening, and fortunately, we saw this coming really early, uh, Industry 4.0 enables new emerging technologies, Internet of Things, connected sensors, artificial intelligence, all kinds of, of things came out of this concept of automizing. But these new technologies, they also make new business models, new ways of earning money possible. So for SKF, we are still into tribology um, and how bearings work and why bearings work and when they certainly don't work. But we work in a different manner where customers will be paying us when something works. And when it doesn't work, they will not be paying us. And that means a very different challenge for tribology because what we have to minimize is now suddenly the total cost of ownership. Uh, so we don't want any stops. So the downtime part in this diagram here has to be reduced. And actually, uh, the maintenance costs and lifetime part use as well. So for us now, suddenly, instead of 
saying, okay, you will buy our really great bearings and you take care of them and whatnot. We are saying we are now responsible to keep your machine spinning. And now SKF needs the ability to predict the future. And now we start coming to the tricky parts because predicting the future or moving from reactive maintenance to proactive and then predictive maintenance is a very different animal. If you uh, know your bearing life modeling, you know that we are working usually with something called L10. L10 is built on um, uh, fatigue-based failures. So the steel is cracking from within and uh, from the maximum stress on the surface somewhere. And then lots of people are adjusting those models to surface uh, initiated, but it's still based on subsurface initiated failure. Now, I can tell you it's not a secret. Almost no bearings fail from subsurface initiated fatigue. So we're designing for something that is not happening. And that means that our life models are not very good for predictive maintenance. If we need to predict when maintenance is about or should be done, then we cannot use the normal L10 approach. Also, it's way too unprecise. So typically, uh, what you see here on the screen uh, is a, they call it a PF curve. So it's a, from potential failure to uh, going through a real failure and a functional failure when something stops. So in a, a paper mill, like what you saw on the screen before, there is some point where a defect starts. And a defect could be a little crack, it can be a dent, it can be a corrosion damage, it can be even a misalignment somewhere, uh, somebody mounted the bearing wrong. And you might see uh, some kind of little gray frosting on the bearing. This looks like micro pitting, something in that direction. And it's only on one of the raceways, so this particular bearing was probably a little bit misaligned. It's a defect, but if the paper machine roll is lightly loaded, this could run for months. It could actually run for years. For a tribologist with a microscope or a SEM, this is horrible. This is really, really bad. But for a real machine operator, this is nothing. We see bearings like that all the time, and they function. Now, with time, okay, lightly loaded, nothing happens. But if it's a little bit more loaded, or if you have frequent start stops, or you happen to have really poor lubrication because somebody uh, washed down the paper machine with a pressure hose, this might start escalating, this type of damage. And no, it's not the same bearing what I have here. So these are different bearings, the spherical roller bearings, uh, but they fail from different reasons. So the third picture here, now you start seeing a spall actually, but hmm, yeah, well, that spall, there are machines that run with spalls like that. They just shake a little bit. However, what happens here is of course, you might get what we see on the last picture, a really bad failure, and that machine, then the bearing is jumping up and down, and so is the shaft, and your paper that you thought you were producing might be spinning out um, without control in the paper mill. So here, we need to be able to predict this. We need to know if the time scale on the x-axis here is, is it one hour from the first failure? Is it one week? Is it three years? Or what is it? Because it's also expensive to stop a machine when you don't need to and see, oh, there's a little bit of frosting. Nobody cares. Uh, so here we need to be able to predict, in fact, where and, of course, subsurface fatigue and other things. But where is a key thing? And corrosive wear, if we talk paper machines, that's extremely important. Also erosive wear because there is always particles going on. So how good are we at that? And how good are we at even picking up uh, when a problem will be happening long before we see any vibration signals? So nothing has happened. And that is what we have to do because we need to know well, well, well in advance so that we can change the oil, um, slow down the machine, prolong the uh, running until the next stop. So how good are we to predict where? I have a favorite tribology paper, and uh, 
It is a paper by uh, May and Ludema, and it's from 1995, it was published. If you have not read this paper, I really advise you to do it, because it has also it's written in beautiful British English. I, so I'm a fan. Um, in this paper, they did a massive literature study. You can see on the right, they, in those days, scouted through or went through 300 different equations. Um, they read 5,466 papers. Hmm, think about that. I think some students were involved here as well. But anyway, uh, and these papers, they found a bunch of wear models. However, if you read this abstract, I won't read it to you, but basically, yeah, no single predictive equation or group of limited equations could be found for general and practical use. Now, that's Meng and Ludema for you. Uh, there is no, pra no equations for practical use. And uh, if we go further and look at what was it, what parameters, because they say that they found uh, um, only for erosive wear, they found 28 different equations or wear models, because they don't even call them equations. They're, they're word models, some of them. Uh, in this, they found, you can see all the different parameters that they have on the left-hand side here. And then the X is where a certain parameter is used in a certain model. I can tell you that when you're out in a paper mill, you do not know uh, the critical strain of anything. You do not know what kind of particles may show up and what fibers you were even using this week, and what the uh, pH of your water could possibly be. So there is lots of things you do not know, and this is what they mean with practicality of wear models. Now, this means, and of course, uh, science has progressed since 1995, but I know that there are still no wear model that we can use to do true predictive maintenance. So, instead, we have taken a somewhat different approach. We have taken the artificial intelligence approach in SKF. And that one, uh, I don't know how much you know about it, but a, a digital twin, that's basically what we want to have a digital twin of that paper machine that I showed you in the beginning. You want a, um, a digital representation of that paper machine because then you can simulate in some way when something will happen before it has happened. So you can do that with physics. So you can basically model a paper machine, but it's very difficult, I can assure you. You can, uh, on the other end of the scale, uh, so the white box model is where you use physics to build your twin. On the right-hand side, you have the black box approach, which is really machine learning and artificial intelligence. And that is really, you just take uh, statistics in a multivariate space, and you do regression analysis until you find patterns, and that's artificial intelligence. I'm very sorry if I offend any data scientists, because I know that's a simplification, uh, but it, it is, hmm, sort of. And you can do a hybrid model, and I will come back to this, but we have, what I, can, what I will be showing you is where we are doing predictions for maintenance using the very black box approach on the right hand side. And so let's go back to a typical paper machine. They look like this. This is uh, from a paper machine in Thailand. And you can see that there are uh, yeah, lots of unknown parameters in here. This machine is spinning and it's, it's like you can't step close because it's so hot and it's uh, uh, splashing out corrosive water. But in, in paper machines, you have a, a compressor. It's a typical uh, machine that sits there and uh, comp uh, compresses. Uh, it could be air, it could be uh, fluid, it could be steam that you are compressing because you want to blow it into the machine. And it's a critical piece of that machinery. So in SKF, we use artificial intelligence and we call it Enlight AI. But we use artificial intelligence to collect signals that are Yes, vibration signals from bearings, but we don't stop there. We look at things like the pressure from the compressor or in the compressor. We look at temperature of liquid or input output. 
we can look look at a number of different more uh, parameters, speed, whatever. And we find correlation. So really the black box approach. Now, um, this might be a little bit tricky and it is because there are many different algorithms. So what you see here is, for example, pressure, vibration and temperature, uh, three different signals. We use different existing algorithms and what we are very good at is uh, to find the best fit between the signals we get to an existing algorithm. That one didn't fit. So we have an automated machine modeling, you can say. So this is really a black box. And I must say, as a mechanical engineer, I had real problems with this. But I don't understand what's going on. I really don't. And it's very scary because suddenly you get conclusions that you cannot explain, but they seem to be right. So what is it that we can't explain? Well, back to my paper machine again. Uh, here, with using this AI approach and no physics, mind you, no physics, we have been able to, on average, predict issues 14 days before anyone can predict them. In uh, continuous casting, steel, so this is not paper, but very different environment, eight days in advance. And this is with, with things like the steel. A problem could be that the steel uh, gets stuck and runs molten out over the bearings. So it not even has nothing to do with tribology. That is also possible to predict when you use artificial intelligence because AI can, can look at so many types of data. One, I'll show you a bit more on the, on the case study. What is it that we are doing? What are we predicting? And now you see a real pump and a real motor driving uh, one of the rolls in a paper machine. And in between the yellow thing is a coupling. So we had uh, lots of failures and nobody was really able to predict them. So no predictive maintenance, only reactive maintenance. And that was with all the life models and typical ways of vibration monitoring and whatnot. So we went in and we looked at a number of different lines where a motor was driving a pump. So asset means there is a motor, a coupling and a pump. We were able, we looked at historical data First, before you put the AI into use, you look at predictive, uh, you look at the history. And uh, we were capable of predict events. And the key thing is to look at field identification. The average time is 14 days. And we could even do it on 16 days. And this was without training the algorithm on anything else than a set of existing data. So here is why I'm asking is tribology wearing off because these predictions are done with no physics behind. They are only black box modeling. Is 16 days or 14 days enough in prediction? No, it's actually not. It is really good to know two weeks ahead that something will be failing without before it's even failed. Because if you think about those two guys on the first picture with the big bearing, if they would know 14 days in advance, they could take it out they could polish up uh, stuff that wasn't even visible, and we could adjust the process, uh, in that case, the crusher, way before anything happened. Signals look typically like this, and this is so this is what uh, the type of data that you feed to this artificial intelligence uh, algorithm. But uh, so different uh, parts of uh, the data will give you different predictions, but all together, that's where the AI does the regression analysis that humans are not capable of doing. It's just too large amounts of data for us. So it's this kind of work and we are using AI today without any uh, physics. But when I said before, we are not happy with only two weeks uh, warning. We need more. Why do we need more? Because if uh, a product is about to fail, nobody, no paper mill or mine can plan a maintenance stop on a two-week horizon. They have to know much longer in advance. Uh, preferably, they'd like to know half a year in advance. We have a planned maintenance stop in September of this year. What should we replace? What should we? What kind of technicians should we invite? 
uh, so that we do everything that is needed in September of this year. So you can hear that two weeks is not enough. So how are we going to do that? Well, the trick here is, of course, to combine the physics and the understanding with the AI. And this is what we are working on right now. So we haven't waited until we have the finalized hybrid solution, but this is where we are working on. So knowledge about tribology, like, for example, uh, what I learned in school, what Meng and the Dema knew, what many of you listening already know, and combine that with what the data scientists who have no idea, they, they really could not understand the tribology problem or even a surface if they fell over, um, or it's very rare that they do. But to combine these two different ways of looking at the world, and that might be easy to say, but I can tell you, if you ever worked in a university with different departments, you have the material science department and you have the mathematics department. How often do they really work together? I know they write science applications to the European Union together, that I know. But do they really work together to look at problems from different angles? Because I think that is where the big challenge, the te there are technology challenges. How exactly do you combine a physics-based model with a statistics-based model and trust it as well? And by the way, you have to do this. We don't have 15 years to do it. We have, at best, we have five years to do this, or we, I should say, but if we don't do it um, from SKF side, we know that there are competitors and they're probably more from China than from anywhere else. We know that there are competitors that will be ahead of us. So we don't have 10 years. We don't have five years. Maybe we have two years and we need to be first. So for us, this is a problem we work on right now but we're not waiting until we have the wonderful hybrid model. We're using the black box model. We try to educate our tribology, um, our material scientists, our calculation engineers in data science, and we try to hire people that have um, mechanical engineering background with data science uh, on top or pure data science, but really have teams that are from both sides and they work together on forming this hybrid model. So, my final slide, is then tribology wearing off? No, it's actually not wearing off, but I would say if tribology and um, the, the science is around tribology, if it is not learning to use models uh, or artificial intelligence like uh, what I showed here, and combine the actual knowledge about the subject with the data science, then I am afraid that it will be wearing off. I am afraid it will be too slow. And then we will sit with only black box solutions that are mysteries to us humans. And that is not a really good future. I, I mean, it is I think it will also be a poor prediction. I think we will have much better predictions if we can combine the physics with the artificial intelligence. So I do think tribology will stay, but we working in tribology need to realize that it has to become a tool in maintenance and in assessing a business risk because the tribology wear models we have, they have to come to use. We have to use them for these two guys here to tell them when should you take out that bearing? When is the risk too big to leave it in? And that means we have to come to a better, uh, to practical use predictions. So uh, the traditional approach additivated by a bit of artificial intelligence, uh, that is probably the better and faster approach, and the one where we are sure we will succeed as well. So, I hope I gave you a little insight in uh, practical uh, tribology and how a big corporation like SKF is uh, thinking about it and why we are even interested in it. Thank you very much, Victoria. Really Great. interesting Thank talk. Um, Chiara? Um, um, so 
Yeah, yeah, we have some questions. Um, so Pedro Vina asks if you the, use the predicted data uh, for defect elimination strategy or for redesign of your components. For actually for both, uh, we we use it for right now mainly for predicting issues in uh, um, in customer production because that is the imminent. That's really the key thing right now. Uh, with a bit more time, it will be used to redesign our components as well. Because you will see, think one obvious, fairly obvious thing already is uh, uh, that a lot of our products, they actually fail because of corrosion, not because of overload. And the more statistics we get on that, we, we, when we can actually trust it, when it's not only hearsay, then we can start redesigning so that the steel we use is more corrosion resistant than what, is what it is load carrying, if you see what I mean. And, and that is a very different way for this, uh, to design. But why did we design in the way we did? Because bearing selection and bearing life calculation is ISO standardized, it's extremely conservative, and in that one you get no bonuses for corrosion resistance only for load carrying capacity. So the C value, the curse of the C value with bearing design, I hope that that disappears before I retire in a few years. Thank you. Um, there's another question by Michael Volok. Uh, asks, is, uh, is your AI able to work for systems and components that it has not been trained on with previous data? For example, a new type of paper machine or some other large machine? Uh, yes, it can. That's a really that's a really great question. From different paper machines, we can actually see that it is a lot easier for our AI to jump from a paper machine to the next one. It's more difficult to take it from a paper machine to a, a aluminum uh, production machine. More difficult, I should say. But you always need you need to train the algorithm on something. So no, we cannot just throw it in on new data. It needs to get some historical data to be trained on. But if, it, if you take the trained algorithm from one paper machine, you give it the data set from the new machine and you allow it to be trained on that. We have a two weeks deployment time. And that actually has to do with what I showed you. I didn't go in detail on that, but um, the, the patterns that we have are really around finding the right algorithm, not on the actual algorithms themselves. So we use uh, public source algorithms but we have a method to optimize on the best one quickly. And that is important when you shift from one machine to another, or even when you have a maintenance stop and you maybe recalibrate or you realign the shaft, then you actually start with a almost new or new-ish data set and you need to retrain the algorithm. So that's actually why we work in this way uh, that we put the focus on quick, finding of the right algorithm. So uh, it always requires some training, but the way we approach it, we know we have compared with quite some other big companies on, on this. We know that the way we went about this is a, a different one. So that, and I can also tell you that the SKF AI algorithm, it's based on an Israeli company that we acquired last year. The company used to be called Presenso, and they had this uh, technology working. We acquired them. And of course, what I show you with the, they had nothing of the physics. They had the black box and not any understanding of the machine. And that was a good thing because they didn't come in with any uh, preconceived opinions. Uh, and now with our, we, we kind of get their view without bias, which is super good. Great, thank you very much. I think that's all the questions we have time for and over to James now. Uh, yeah, just like to thank our speakers one more time. Uh, thanks to Victoria and, and Ashley for both the great talks. Um, next week is our is our final seminar. Um, so yeah, tune in at the, at the same time next week. Uh, see you then. And just final thank to our sponsors, the Royal Society of Chemistry, Swiss Tribology, the Institute of Physics and the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, thanks everyone. Thank you.